Hi, everybody. We have a lot of events going on this week, a lot of really great opportunities for you to continue doing good work together. And so one of the things that I'd invite you to do right now is actually to pause these announcements. Um, pause them right here. Uh, go open up your calendar app on your phone or get your paper calendar if you're old school like I am and get ready to make a commitment. A commitment uh, to write it down, to put it in your calendar, uh, to do uh, one, hopefully more than one, of these events and opportunities this week so that we can continue doing important work together as a faith community this summer as we do particular work and focus on how to be an anti-racist, taken from the title of our book uh, that we will be studying this summer by Ibram X. Kendi. Got your calendars? Okay, good. Here's some of the things that we have going on this week that we hope to see you at and that you participate in with us together as faith community. First off, a quick reminder that that book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi, is our book focus for this summer as a part of our summer series. Um, Molly has placed an order for some of those that she heard from you who would like them. Thank you. We had... Um, an absolutely overwhelming response to that. Um, she did order a few extra. However, if uh, you did not get a chance to put in your order, um, we'd invite you to go ahead and order those right now. Uh, we are going to have several book discussions uh, over Zoom for those. We haven't set those dates yet because we want to make sure that we get the books in and get them distributed. However, we would invite you, if you didn't get a chance to order them uh, with Molly, uh, to check with some of your local booksellers. We've partnered with La Playa Books in the past. There's many others, um, Verbatim Books in North Park also, um, or to consider doing an audio book uh, through Audible or one of those other services. That can be a great way also uh, to listen to them and engage with the ideas. Um, we are uh, getting ready to get those books, uh, send them out to everyone who ordered them, go ahead and get yours and be working through them so that we're ready to discuss that. This week in particular though, on Tuesday night, uh, we are hosting a, a Netflix watch party um, for the important documentary 13th. Uh, if you have Netflix, Angeli Raya is going to lead that uh, Netflix watch party so that we can watch the movie together and discuss it in the chat window. Um, and if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, you can email her directly at, an at angeliaraya at gmail.com, or it's also in the weekly email. So feel free to check that uh, link there also. And that's in preparation for our Faith on Tap, which will be uh, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, June 25th. And uh, that will be a discussion of that documentary. Also, a quick uh, update that it is not only on Netflix, but it's also on YouTube for free. Um, so it is readily available for everyone to watch for our discussion for that. Also this week uh, on Wednesday and Thursday night, so the following nights after the Netflix watch party, um, a very, very important and I would say um, urgent opportunity for us. The Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis is hosting an online uh, workshop on uh, anti-racism, which pairs very well with the book, um, has uh, some of the same work and ideas, but uh, certainly Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis brings her own perspective to that. And uh, part of the benefit of that is that is over Zoom. And uh, so uh, that is a really great opportunity we're inviting everyone to. Um, this is important work, not just for us as individuals, but us as faith community and us as part of this uh, large society and culture in which this great movement is happening. Um, it is $20 uh, for both of those nights um, for, uh, let's see, it is Wednesday and Thursday night, the 17th and 18th, $20 total, um, which, covers, which covers both of those evenings. If money is an object for you, please uh, send us an email directly. We can absolutely cover that for you. Um, that is, This is going to be an important class. Um, it's amazing that we get the chance and opportunity to be able to learn from her and engage uh, with her over this uh, medium, uh, which previously probably would not have been available to us except for now that we are sheltering in place. So it's an incredible opportunity for that, and we'd invite you into that. So check those out. Um, those are a lot of great ways to stay connected, whether you're ordering your book this week, uh, whether you're in the Netflix party with Anjali, or whether you are engaging um, in that master workshop on how to be an anti-racist uh, with Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis. A lot of important things coming up in this week ahead. I'd invite you to schedule those, calendar them, uh, commit, me commit yourself uh, to doing this important, significant work with us together as faith community in this week and moving forward. 
Hope to see you all soon and enjoy our worship video this morning as we all worship together. See you soon. Hey everyone, I wanted to highlight once again our COVID relief fund that we uh, began a few months ago at this point. Um, and just to respond to the needs of our community during this time, whether that's help with rent, groceries, mental health services, whatever it might be. Um, and we still have funds in that account. And so we wanted to let you know that as this pandemic drags on, even with things opening, uh, we're not back to normal yet. And so uh, if your work was still impacted by everything or you're just in a place where you could use a little extra help, uh, please fill out the Google form that's in the description of the video uh, or is in the weekly email. And that just lets us know what's going on so we can help and respond um, and continue to get through this time together as a community. Thanks everyone, bye. Hi guys, I'm Kendra Green Carson and this week the reading is Exodus 1, 8 through 2, 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the Israelites people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, 
They set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses for Pharaoh, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew wives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? And the midwives said to the Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi met and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months, but she could hide him no longer. So she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitum and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. Her sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it up, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to the Pharaoh, shall I go get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the mother's child. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. And she named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. Amen. Hi, everyone. Um, This week's contemporary reading is by Haki R. Madubidi, and it is entitled For the Consideration of Poets. Where is the poetry of resistance, the poetry of honorable defiance, unafraid of lies from career politicians and businessmen, not respectful of journalists who write official speak, void of educated thought, without double search or subsurface questions that war talk demands? Where is the poetry of doubt and suspicion? Not in the service of the state, bishops and priests. Not in the service of beautiful people and late night promises. Not in the service of influence, incompetence, and academic clown talk. you 
lead me seminary, I took a course titled Women Leaders of the Medieval Church. I took it partly because I was required to take a course on medieval church history, but I was also excited to learn about the different ways women found avenues of leadership in church history. I didn't expect to relate much to them, for many of them were mystics who had elaborate experiences of dreams and visions, which I have not had. But I was interested to learn their stories, as so much of history is focused on men's contributions alone. And as a part of the course, we were all assigned a medieval woman to research and present to the class. And this is how I was introduced to Marjorie Kent. Marjorie's life and circumstances were very different from mine. She was born in 1373, married at the age of 20, and had 14 children. That's right. 14 children. It's no wonder that soon after she felt called to a life of celibacy. And although she could neither read nor write, she dictated her thoughts to two men, which were compiled in a book containing visions, tales of her life and travels, vivid depictions of the society and culture around her, and exhortations to the reader. And as I read these tales of her life, I began to relate to her in ways that I did not expect. Marjorie's book depicts an outspoken and vivacious woman attempting to live a spiritual and devout life in the world rather than in a religious order. 
She pushed against the misogynistic systems in the church at her time, calling out priests and bishops for their mistreatment of people, and defying their order that she refrain from preaching on the basis of her sex. I remember sitting in the quiet section of the library reading her words, unable to keep myself from laughing at her sense of humor, much to the disdain of those trying to study near me, I'm sure, and interrupting my study partner's work to read aloud excerpt after excerpt of her book. This woman, who lived so long before me, became someone I saw parts of myself in, and I was encouraged and empowered by her life and words. And as I read our passage for today, I felt a similar connection. The story is ancient, but at the same time, it is very much like the story we find ourselves in today. As such, we as modern readers are invited to find ourselves in the narrative, knowing that we may feel convicted of who we identify with, but at the same time finding hope in the possibility of change it offers all of us. Our passage begins by telling the reader that a new king arose over Egypt, one who did not know Joseph. This significance cannot be understated. As you may remember, Joseph was a man we learned about in the previous book of Genesis. He had been sold into slavery in Egypt by his own brothers, but when he arrived, he ended up making such a name for himself by saving vast amounts of people from an upcoming famine that he earned his freedom and even became an advisor to the king. His relationship with the king even won all his people, including his family, and the very same brothers who sold him into slavery, a favored status in the land. So the narrator telling us that this king did not know Joseph signifies that he has forgotten, either unknowingly or deliberately, the shared history between his people and Joseph's people who had become known as the Israelites. He had forgotten that they had only thrived when they did so together. He had forgotten that it was because of Joseph that his own people had survived, paving the way for them to later thrive as a civilization. His forgetfulness, whether intentional or not, created the landscape that would lead to what happens next. For this Pharaoh, this ruler immediately begins to view the Israelites as a threat. He says, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. Pharaoh uses the tactic of fear to garner support for his grand plan, forcing the Israelites into slavery oppressing them with labor, and creating a system that would benefit him and his people alone. Notice the rhetoric Pharaoh employs in this moment, the rhetoric of us versus them. I'll read it again. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. This rhetoric is intentional and has been used throughout history to amass power for one person or group. This is the language of oppression. Also notice that Pharaoh's claimed fear is that the Israelites will both grow in number and that they will eventually leave. For Pharaoh's system to succeed, it needs the Israelites to have less power in the form of a smaller population than the Egyptians, but it also needs them to remain in Egypt. It needs them to be their unpaid workforce, aka slaves, creating profit in the form of supply cities. But what happens next was not in Pharaoh's plan, for we are told that the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. And while the word here clearly means they multiplied in number, I have to imagine it also meant that they not only increased, but they were a thriving people. Unfortunately, it was no longer just Pharaoh who feared the Israelites, but the Egyptians had come to believe his lies about them, and they were filled with dread. So they created new systems with which to oppress the Israelites, making their labor harder and treating them ruthlessly. But even this wasn't enough. So Pharaoh summoned two of the Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua, and commanded them to kill the baby boys when they were born. His goal was to create a new system, 
one that would cripple the Israelite community by killing its young boys. But unbeknownst to him, Shipra and Pua feared God more than Pharaoh and crafted a plan. I want to pause in the story here because this phrase, to fear God, is one that I believe needs parsing for our modern lens. In the Hebrew scriptures, the fear of the Lord is often coupled with knowledge of God. And the word itself can also be translated as awe instead of fear. So another way of understanding this is that Shipra and Pua knew who God was, and because of that knowledge, knew what it meant to follow her in this situation. That is, not to kill the Hebrew boys. But they knew that the systems Pharaoh had created to oppress their people were strong. So they acted shrewdly, devising a plan for when he would question them about what they, why they had not done as he had commanded. They told him that the Hebrew women were more vigorous than the Egyptian woman, and therefore gave birth too quickly for them to do anything about it. Another translation for the word vigorous here is full of life. The very essence of these women was that their fullness of life was stronger than Pharaoh's command of death. And because of the midwives, the Israelites continued to multiply and thrive. Because of Shipra and Pua, the system was beginning to be dismantled. The Pharaoh's quest for power would continue. For this time, he went to all his people, all the Egyptians, commanding them to be the enforcers of these commands. And they, primed by his us versus them rhetoric, obeyed his command to throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile. We're not told how the Egyptians felt about this horrific command. Maybe some were all too ready to obey. Maybe others were apprehensive but didn't want the status quo to change. Regardless, their silence conveys their complicity. And then the story shifts from a grand overview of these events to specific characters. And what the Hebrew storytelling does in these next few verses is so intentional. Even in the midst of this great oppression, a Hebrew man from the tribe of Levi married a Hebrew woman. As things go, they conceived and bore a son, and his mother saw that he was a fine baby. The Hebrew here is clear, for it is the same phrasing as the first creation story in Genesis, when God created and saw that God's creation was good. By aligning the birth of this baby with God's initial creation, it is clear to us that something powerful is happening with this birth. We are told that the mother hid the baby until she could no longer, so she put him in a basket in the Nile. The Hebrew word for basket could also be translated as little ark. The storyteller has already reminded us of God's creation and is now reminding us of God's saving of Noah and his family in the ark during the flood. Let it also not be lost on us that the baby is put into the Nile. The place which was meant to be his death became his avenue to life. I can't imagine the feelings his mother would have had knowing that this was her last most desperate chance of saving her son. But I know this, that courageous act was another step in the dismantling of the system. What happens next is fascinating because on one hand, it may seem as though it is pure coincidence, but in reality, I think it's clearly intentional. Pharaoh's daughter, yes, the very Pharaoh who ordered the systemic oppression of the Israelite people, including the killing of their newborn boys, finds the baby in the reeds of the Nile. His sister had been watching to see where he went and chose the perfect moment to reveal herself from her hiding place just as Pharaoh's daughter realizes that the baby was one of the Israelites. The sister offers to get one of the Hebrew women to come nurse the baby and of course runs directly to her mother. And it is in this way that the baby's own mother is tasked with nursing him and even gets paid for her labor. It's unclear in the passage, but with how cleverly the Hebrew storytelling has been to this point, I think it's safe to say that all of the women, Pharaoh's daughter included, were in on this scheme together. These women worked across class and ethnic divides to begin the dismantling of a system of oppression. And for those of us who know how this story continues, the baby grows up to be Moses, the one who would lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. 
and it would be that event in the history of the Israelite people that God would continually remind them of in order to keep them from doing the same to other nations. They would be commanded to not be like Pharaoh, who forgot the history of his people and the Israelite people, but to remember that they had been slaves in Egypt, and therefore they would deal kindly with the strangers in their midst. They would be commanded not to employ the us versus them rhetoric that had been used to oppress them in the past. Friends, I read this story in the parallels to the history of the United States and how we're seeing that manifested today seems so obvious. But I will admit that as I read it, I feel convicted. I feel convicted that the church throughout history has often been more aligned with Pharaoh than with the Israelites. I feel convicted that as a white person, I benefit from the system of oppression and therefore am more like one of the Egyptians participating in a system that benefits me at the expense of others. I feel convicted that we as a whole have not listened to the voices of marginalized women, particularly black trans women, who are all too often doing the work of dismantling systems of oppression while getting none of the credit or the justice they deserve. But I also feel hope. I feel hope that it is possible to work across the things that divide us in partnership to dismantle systems of oppression. I feel hope when I realize that God is at work in this story through people who know her and are willing to act. I feel hope that we all have a part in this work and the weight of the task does not rest solely on any one person's shoulders. I feel hope that things can change for the better if only we participate in the work together. And the work that is at hand right now and will continue throughout our lives is the work of anti-racism. What we're seeing right now is the dismantling of racist systems and we all have a part to play. Your part might be educating yourself about the history of racism in this country or its current forms. Your part might be marching in protest. Your part might be confronting the racism within yourself and your loved ones. Your part might be writing to and calling your elected officials, demanding changes. Your part might be holding space for the grief, pain, and suffering of too many. Your part might be amplifying the black and brown voices as they educate, create, and show us what a more just and peaceful future can be. Whatever your part, it's time to step into it. This summer, we'll be diving into this conversation with our summer series, How to Be an Anti-Racist. We'll be reading the book of the same title, highlighting anti-racist workshops, and giving you opportunities to support the black community here in San Diego and beyond. But the work will continue past this summer. The work of dismantling systems of oppression is lifelong and will manifest in different ways throughout our lives. And that thought might be daunting to you, but I don't want to hide the reality from you, for that is what can lead to burnout along the way. So take your Sabbath rest, for it is finding that rest that allows us to continue in this work. And have hope, for change is possible. Amen.